Welcome to the world of animal allies, the doctors, volunteers, pet owners, and other surprising visitors who are out there making a difference. In Australia, animal doctors give Phil the Gibbon a full medical before he's reunited with his baby daughter. While in Denmark, the Green Army helps out native animals. Cats are predatory. How to has the tips on curbing your cat's hunting instincts. And in Animal World, flesh-eating fish are battling scientists. Phil the white-cheeked gibbon is a hard fellow to catch. He's due for his medical checkup, and though he's getting on in years, he's still swinging. But it's been a rough time for the gibbon family at the Perth Zoo. Mother Vianne hasn't been able to breastfeed her baby, Germay, and the little one has had to be hand-reared by keepers. Having tranquilised the elusive Phil, animal doctors move him quickly into surgery. The medical team has only an hour to complete the examination. Keeping an older animal under an anaesthetic is always potentially risky, and the less time Phil's under, the better. Any problems because we don't get our hands on that often. It's good to get these things then, rather than find out a bit later on that there's something we could have detected earlier. And while Phil is out like a light, the baby of the family is proving to be a real bright spark. Jemay means strong-willed and beautiful, and the playful youngster is certainly that. The precious baby Gibbon has been bottle-fed formula by zookeepers several times a day for six months, after Mother Vianne's milk dried up. And she also gets some fruit and vegetables. Uh, she's got her favourites. She likes strawberry and banana and uh, sweet potato as well. White-cheeked gibbons are born fawn or blonde, but become black around Germay's age. And that's how they stay until maturity, at about five to seven years. The female then becomes a fawn colour, but a small patch on the crown remains black. Staff encourage Germay's social interaction and physical development. Having these skills will make the reunion with her fa family a smooth one. At the other end of the zoo, keepers are dealing with two other youngsters. These six-month-old Nepalese red panda cubs are only just weaned and easily frightened. They may not mean to hurt anyone, but their claws are razor sharp and their developing canine teeth can inflict a nasty bite. While they're young, keepers have decided to permanently identify the endangered pandas by microchipping. To do that, the pandas have to be anaesthetized. Back on the operating table, the animal doctors are checking Phil's eyes. They also check his limbs for signs of arthritis. Gibbons rarely live beyond 30 years, and Phil is fast approaching that milestone. Phil's vision and mobility are important for his active lifestyle high up in the trees. The first panda to be given a gas anaesthetic is little Aru. She's barely six months old and is only just starting to make the change from mother's milk to an adult diet of bamboo and fruit. It's a risky time because some cubs do not make the transition to solid food. And because there are fewer than two and a half thousand red pandas left in the world, the zoo's medical team is making sure the cubs are in the best of health. As Nepalese red pandas are so endangered, little Aru could eventually be sent to a zoo anywhere in the world for breeding. Electronic identification is a foolproof way of keeping track of her. But first, like Phil, she'll be given a complete checkup, and that includes her fascinating feet. Because they come from 
cold climates there would basically come from the Himalayas and they're very used to being in snow. They have these inbuilt fluffy snow boot feet and it's consistent with their whole coat which is very, very thick and protects them from the cold weather. When we return in Animal Doctors Part 2, we'll see exactly how doctors implant an electronic ID into Aru and we'll get the all-important results of Phil's physical. Denmark's wildlife is fighting to survive. Most of the country's natural environment has been cleared for farming. The native animals cling to small patches of wilderness on military land, where the army trains for war. This army is engaged in no ordinary battle. They've adopted a green attitude to save Denmark's wildlife. Thousands of acres of firing ranges have been turned into nature reserves. Where their tanks once roamed is now strictly for the birds. Erling Krabber is a senior biologist recruited by the Ministry of Defence to revolutionise Denmark's approach to military training was the military's own initiative. Uh, they wanted to do the whole environmental uh, uh, issue and deal with that, including taking care of the nature. Uh, they've been willing to leave out large areas out of practice. They've been willing to raise old drained wetlands, which means that they can't drive there any longer, things like that. It is Commander Niels Krarup's job to educate the troops on where they can and can't go. Every unit uh, has uh, these maps and the idea is that in fact every soldier training out here has this map in his pocket and it uh, tells him uh, which areas are category one, which are two, which are three uh, and so on. Category one, you're only allowed to move by foot uh, in there and along existing roads and existing tracks. In the category two, you have to make your main movements during existing facilities, but you are allowed to move uh, single vehicles uh, and so on away from the road or the tracks. And in category three, we have no restrictions. You are allowed to do whatever the unit commander decides is the best to do in this situation. One of the areas where the army needs to tread carefully is the heathland, one of them of the few left in Denmark, and the home of the rare golden plover. A century ago, the golden plover was a familiar sight until their habitat was taken over by agriculture. Now there are only three breeding pairs returning here. The army has other ways of protecting the environment, as Warrant Officer John Illerman explains. This is where we normally maintain the tanks, and uh, all that garbage we produce here had to be recycled. We put them in separate bins, and this is uh, ordinary garbage which just uh, has to be burned. And uh, the last one here, if we got uh, waste some oil at the floor, we have to absorb it with this oil absorbing gravel. When the mechanics change the oil from the tanks, they put it in uh, this oil drum, and when it is full, they took it uh, over to the vault from where they pump it to the storage tank where it has to be recycled. In front of this uh, black line, the bricks are sealed, so if we got any accident here, with chemicals, we go to this drain, which has a special filter to prevent any damage to the environment. As well as eliminating pollution hazards, the army offers a helping hand by building safe homes for animals. Perched high in a purpose-built nest box, secured in one of the many lookout towers, a pair of kestrels have found a new home.
Hunting almost constantly, the parents return to feed their young every 20 minutes. The Danish military would be the first ones worldwide who have initiated this nature management planning in the training terrain. That's quite a unique thing, I think. Through the military's efforts, Denmark is showing the world how the competing forces of man and nature can exist in harmony. After the break, Animal Allies returns with Dr. Fish curing skin conditions and the Gibbon family starts a new life together. Stripes may not look like a killer, but don't be fooled, <laughs> he's a nightmare for native animals. He's a very sweet boy. Domestic and feral cats kill millions of native birds, reptiles and marsupials, some to the point of extinction. Animal Allies Guide to Protecting Wildlife from Your Furry Feline. Cat owner George Traub has brought stripes to veterinarian researcher Joyce Ede for advice on keeping striped paws away from wildlife. One of the things that you can do is to make sure that your cat has a collar with bells on it. Some cats do learn to stop off effectively with just one bell, but you can put two or more bells on the collar to make the noise increase. He's got a big tummy because he eats biscuits and he likes prawns. He's very fussy about what he eats. Providing sufficient food for your cat won't stop its natural instinct to hunt, but it will help. It is a myth, actually, that well-fed cats don't hunt, but by keeping him well-fed, you are minimising his urges to hunt for food. One of the best ways to make sure that Stripes doesn't hunt is to keep him inside, because cats are very active at night time and they do a lot of their hunting during the night time hours. Playing is a natural need for cats. Just make sure their recreation is not hunting wildlife. If you make sure that he's entertained while he's inside, it, it relieves boredom and also minimises his hunting for play. So it's good to have toys for stripes. Something like this, which has a bell inside and makes noise, is good. Or even something like this, which has a bit of texture in it. I... To prevent unwanted kittens, stripes has also been sterilised. So for this week's Animal Allies how-to, Put a collar on your cat with bells on it. Sterilise your cat. Provide sufficient food. Keep your feline inside from dusk to dawn. What makes thousands of people flock to this remote village in Turkey? People from around the world with a single aim in mind. Believe it or not, they're here to voluntarily expose themselves to flesh-eating fish. But it's not what you might think. This is the way most of us imagine a man-eating fish, the savage fury of a great white shark. Or this, the infamous piranha hunting in predatory schools, its razor-like teeth capable of stripping an animal's flesh from its bones in minutes. Turkey's flesh eaters are all about preserving and improving life. They are the mysterious doctor fish, credited with relieving, even curing, a bewildering array of skin and nervous conditions, especially psoriasis. Amazingly, they only target diseased skin they leave healthy skin untouched. While mainstream science dismisses many of these claims, it's hard to ignore the results. This is the third day now, and as you can see, it has almost cleared up. I believe that God has created this fish for us to cure our problems. The doctor fish have intrigued scientists from all over the world, like marine biologist David Booth. Well, of course, there are other fish that interact with humans in this sort of eating way, and uh, they're called predators, and we're talking uh, some of the larger sharks uh, and also things like the piranhas in freshwater. And what makes, again, these fish uh, quite unique is uh, that they feast on human parts, uh, skin in this case, uh, but in a sort of a, a mutualistic sort of way and to the benefit of humans by the looks of things. 
There's no accepted cure for psoriasis, which affects as many as one in 40 people. It produces sometimes painful, always itchy skin lesions covered in scales. And maddeningly for sufferers, psoriasis often proves resistant to treatment, as dermatologist David Wong no knows only too well. Um, the traditional treatments for psoriasis compose mainly of creams, both topical TARS, topical cortisone creams. The next level is to use things like light treatment. Following on that, there's some vitamin A-based medications, some anti-cancer drugs, some transplant drugs, and so on. For many people, these options are either unacceptable, unavailable or unaffordable. They turn to the feasting fish for relief and some claim a cure. I have had this disease for 14 years. I have been here for four days. This is the fifth day and things are going very well. Thanks to God. Well, the doctor fish appear to have a sort of behaviour that a lot of other fishes may have, and that's called a cleaning mutualism. Now, a mutualism involves an interaction between two organisms where both get some sort of benefit. And in the case of the doctor fish, I'd imagine the benefit is in all that extra food in, in the form of uh, human flesh available. And in the case of the humans, they're obviously getting some sort of therapeutic benefit. At face value, the doctor fish are just common carp. But remarkably, they behave in three separate and distinctive therapeutic ways, working together to alleviate psoriasis. Their individual abilities have earned them the titles Strikers, Jabbers and Lickers from Grateful Sufferers. The so-called Strikers start the healing process by attacking the hard, flaky skin, exposing the inflamed area. Then the Jabbers draw blood, Finally, the lickers seal the wounds by secreting saliva. These doctor fish are very unique and I've never really seen anything like it um, for several reasons. Um, they clean humans, for one thing. Um, that's unusual. Also, um, there's more than one species doing the cleaning. Uh, quite often you'll get a single species, but in this case you get up to three species cooperating to clean the humans. And then finally, um, the springs themselves are very warm. They're up over 30 degrees Celsius and very few fish live in these sort of streams uh, anyway, let alone uh, sort of doing this very complicated sort of behaviour. The healing waters contain other secrets too. They're rich in minerals like calcium, magnesium and selenium and are said to have restorative powers in their own right. But it's the doctor fish most sufferers credit with their indisputable improvement in symptoms. I don't believe that there a cure for psoriasis exists, but I think the phenomenon of the doctor fish is interesting in that it seems to alleviate some sufferers with psoriasis. That is why it's an interesting phenomenon. The doctor fish seem to tease off the, the dead skin. I don't think they actually traumatise the skin surface, but any trauma to the skin surface usually aggravates psoriasis. The doctor fish would be the most unusual treatment that I've heard of for psoriasis to date. Unusual, certainly, but for believers, the doctor fish are among God's miracles. This is something very special. God has sent us this fish for a reason. Such is the belief that these fish have amazing healing power. They're now a protected species. With more research, Turkey's doctor fish could prove to be one of the most important catches in the animal world. Back at Western Australia's Perth Zoo, our animal doctors have finished a ruse checkup. The six month old baby Nepalese red panda is in perfect shape. The doctors are now ready to implant an electronic identification device into the youngster. They'll inject it behind the neck where a roux can't reach it and where the skin is loose. So, this is a Trovan um, needle, it's a sterile needle. So, each animal gets their own needle. It looks like a quite a nasty size nice needle but it's very sharp and therefore actually goes in very easily and it pushes up a little electronic chip that stays um, under the skin for the life of the animal and um, permanently identifies them as that individual. So forever we can scan this animal and we know that that's that this particular girl. So if she's sent away from the zoo then over at another zoo they can scan her until all, there'll be no confusion about who she is as an individual. Um, the system is very like the way supermarkets scan items. And just like at the checkout, it always pays to make sure they're operating correctly. 
<laughs> Finally, Aru is weighed to make sure she's eating well. Pandas make deft use of their partially retractable claws to climb to impressive heights. They're nocturnal, normally feeding from dusk to dawn, then sleeping in the crook of a tree or on a branch during the day. Because they're tree climbers, we have to make sure they're very steady before we let them go out into the enclosure, so she'll probably stay with us for maybe up to about um, three quarters of an hour to an hour, but you may be certain that she's quite right to go out. Aru has passed her medical with flying colours. Staff will keep a close eye on the cub until she's fully weaned. And Phil hasn't done too badly either. For his age, he's doing really well. Um, most gibbons sort of live to around about 30 years of age, and given he's at least 28, um, he's, he's doing quite well. I guess his teeth are pretty worn, but you'd expect that with his age. Um, maybe showing some early signs of arthritis, uh, but again, that's, that would be an age-related thing. Um, but yeah, you know, he's, he's very, very healthy. With Father Phil given the all clear, and baby Jamey reunited with her mother, the white-cheeked Gibbon family is happy to be back in each other's company. In the next series, the world of animal allies returns when man becomes best buddies with the unchallenged hunter of the sky, the wedge-tailed eagle. How to look looks at cleaning your pooch's teeth with little fuss. And in Animal World, the amazing story of how a farmer's herd of cows saved him from a vicious bull attack. There are ways to make